this is a big thing. Like this is going to touch all of us. And this is going to, I, I, I am very high conviction that we can manage our way through this. I mean, it's like that very first cell phone with the black and white screen that can only display those like numbers and, you know, it just didn't do much, but there was enough in there. You're like, hmm, I can make a call. That's, that's cool. And at the time that seems great. And then it took us, I don't know how long from that, but many decades from that to the iPhones we have today. And the thing we have today is incredible. And it took a massive amount of scaling in all these different ways to get there. But we have now is like unimaginable at the time of those like first primitive cell phones. And I think that's that's why we have to push forward. We're at this barely useful cell phone, but people still like making phone calls, it turns out. And if you can make a better way for them to do it so they can go walk around the world while they do it, sure, that's great. But that's not what we want to deliver. We want to deliver the iPhone 16 or 15 or whatever the current one is. And what's the timeline to reach the iPhone 16 from the current Motorola that we have? You got to give us, you got to be a little patient. That's like a, you know, it took the world a while to do that last time around. So give us some time. But I will say, I think in a few more years, it'll be much better than it is now. And in a decade, it should be pretty remarkable. And if we're going to compare um, GPT-4 to GPT-5, uh, because you're at the cusp of this, you're actually seeing it at the forefront. What is the difference? Like, if I'm excited about GPT-5, what should I be excited about? I I was sort of laughing a little bit because this is going to sound like an annoying answer, but I think it is the important part. It's going to be smarter. There are all of these other things, you know, we can talk about, it'll be better at these kind of tasks, it'll be multimodal, it'll be faster, What, what, you know, who knows what. But the the thing that I think really matters is it's going to be smarter. This is a bigger deal than it sounds, right? Because what what makes these models so magical is that they're, they're general. And so if it's a little bit better, if it's a little bit smarter, that means it's a little bit better at everything. And the thing that I think is most exciting is it's not like this model is going to get a little better at this task and not really better at these or, you know, it's not that. It's because we're going to make the model smarter, it's going to be better at everything across the board. Have you watched the movie Freaky Friday? where these two people switch places? I've heard of it, but I haven't watched it. So, so the, the thesis or the idea of the movie was two people switched places, they moved into different bodies, and they lived each other's lives. Let's assume today is Freaky Tuesday, and you become the Minister of Artificial Intelligence of the UAE. If you were going to take one regulatory decision for this country, knowing what you know, seeing what you see, what would you do? Does that mean you have to take my job for a day? I would, I would love to do that, just for a day. You have fun with that. It's not as easy as it looks. No, no, I know it's very hard, but I'd love to experience it. That'd be great. Um, anytime you want to switch, I, I, I will <laughs> greatly look forward to that. Um, what I would do... Uh, that was a curveball, by the way. No, no, no. It's, it's a really thoughtful question. I'm trying to give a thoughtful answer. Um, I, I think what I would do is try to... And I know you've done some work in this direction, and I, I really appreciate it. But I, I would try to find a way to create more of a regulatory sandbox where people could experiment with this technology and and be able to figure out sort of like dream, imagine, whatever you want to call it, what the world could look like. Um, and then I would try to see what makes sense and what doesn't and write the regulation around that. I think it's very hard. I think we have to try and we're going to anyway, but I think it's very hard to get all of the regulatory ideas right in a vacuum. And if there was a sort of a contained way that I could find a way to like give people the future and let them experiment it with it and then see what made sense, uh, what, what went really wrong well and really right and write the regulation around that. That seems like an interesting experiment. So I have great news. Um, we already have a platform here called the Reg Lab that does that. The only issue is I think it hasn't proliferated yet to be truly global. Um, one thing that I think we should do is actually look at how we can take it to the next level and use a specific use case there for AI rather than just broad technologies, right? Can I change my answer? I thought more. You can change your answer a hundred times. Go on. I still think that's a good thing to do. But since I only have one day, a better thing to do. Okay. Um, one thing that I have been thinking about, so the world is going to try all of these different regulatory approaches. There will be your sandbox. I think it's awesome that you have that. Other people do other things. But we are going to, and I, I think that's actually really good, but we are going to need, I believe at some point, some sort of a global system. Um, the example that I've given in the past is the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, for what happens with the most powerful of these systems, because they will have truly global impact. And what sort of auditing, what sort of safety measures do we want in place for you can deploy uh, like a super intelligence or, you know, however you want to call an AGI. And I think for a bunch of reasons, the UAE would be so well set up to be a leader in the discussions around that. I would, I would like host a one day conference with leaders from around the world to brainstorm about that. Consider it done. We'll do it. Um, okay. Okay. I'd love to come. Uh, I'd like to just move on to the regulatory issue. So um, I remember the first time we had this conversation on artificial intelligence or regulating AI, 
the dangers, the opportunities was, if I'm not mistaken, was it 2017 uh, that we met in LA when um, yes. you hosted that? Or 16. Either one 16 or 17, one of those years. And, and we were having a discussion and you actually put forward a vision for AI that's going to change the world alongside Elon Musk and a few others. And you also mentioned some of the dangers. There are a lot of efforts today on regulation. There are efforts by the UN. There are efforts by the G20, by the G7 and others. In terms of these efforts, are they hitting the mark, you think? Is there something else that we need to do? We have a lot of people here that represent international organizations and that represent governments. What more should we do? And if it's doing well, how can we make it even better? Frankly speaking, I think we're still on the stage, and this is not necessarily bad, but we're still on the stage of a lot of discussion. So there's, you know, everybody in the world is having a conference. Everybody's got an idea, a policy paper. And that's okay. I think we're still at a time where debate is needed and healthy. But at some point in the next few years, I think we have to move towards like an action plan with, with real buy-in around the world. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like exactly. What is what is necessary to make that happen? I honestly don't think that is for OpenAI to say. I mean, we have a lot of ideas. We've tried to contribute them to the discussion. I think a lot of other people have a lot of ideas. This is a big thing. Like this is going to touch all of us, and this is going to. I, I I am very high conviction that we can manage our way through this, but it's going to take a great deal of collaboration, um, and it's going to take the our leaders of the world coming together. And you know, that's that's I think not for us to set. Maybe um, another thing that we can just jump to quickly. Uh, if we're going to talk about governments that do not have the resources of a company like OpenAI or a country like the UAE, countries that are limited in their resources and the let's say, directions that they can take on these things. What advice do you have for them on the LLM race right now? What should they do? Should they use, in your opinion, closed source or open source tools? Should we choose sides or should we just go for the best application and the best utility? How would you go about this? We're giving this a lot of thought. We're trying to, you know, we want to have like an offering that makes sense for countries that, that want to have offer AI services. But in the meantime, I think what people are doing right now, which is just sort of use these APIs or run open source models, I, I think that'll make sense. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you guys open source GPT-3. Is that correct? GPT-2 we did, I don't think 3. GPT-2, okay. Is there a sense that you guys are going to open source the uh, models as you launch new ones? So, for example, as 5 comes along, you're going to open source 3. Is that something that you guys are thinking about or is that not on the table? I think you should expect us to open source more things over time, but exactly what and when and how we're trying to figure out. There, there are like great open source models, open source language models out in the world now. And, you know, I don't think what the world needs is like another similar model. Um, so we'd like to do something that is helpful and new and we're trying to figure out what that might be. I, I'd like to now just jump into something that the fear mongers and the opportunists talk about. What is the most thing that you fear when it comes to uh, the deployment of AI and the most thing you're, opportuni- uh, uh, you're optimistic about? Like if I'm going to tell you what keeps you up at night and what keeps you going in the morning. Give me one reason for that and one reason for the other. The keep up at night is easy. It's all of the sci-fi stuff. Uh, you know, I think sci-fi writers are a very smart bunch. And in in the decades of sci-fi about AI, uh, there have been unbelievably creative ways to imagine that how this can go wrong. And I think most of them are like comical, but there's some things in there that are easy to imagine where things really go wrong. And I'm not that interested in like the killer robots walking down the street direction of things going wrong. I'm much more interested in the like very subtle societal misalignments where we just have these systems out in society and through no particular ill intention, things just go horribly wrong. But the thing that wakes me up in the morning with energy every day is what I actually believe is things are just going to go tremendously right. We got to work hard to mitigate all of the the downside cases. They are, I think, very significant and, and real potentials to confront. But the reason that we go think so hard about how to deploy this technology safely is the upside is remarkable. I think we can easily imagine a world in the not super distant future where everybody's got a better life than people have today. I think we can raise the standard of living so incredibly much um, if everybody has access to abundant amounts of really high quality intelligence and they can use that tool those tools to create whatever they want to do. That's like pretty amazing. This is like kind of how I think about it, but people are like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to say it anyway. Um, if you think about everybody on earth getting a the resources of a company of like hundreds of thousands of really competent people and what that would do, you know, if you have like an AI programmer, AI lawyer, AI marketer, AI strategist, and not just one of those, but many of each, and you get to sort of like decide how to use that to kind of create whatever you want to create, 
we're all gonna get a lot of great stuff. The creative power of humanity with tools like that should be remarkable. So that's, I think, what gets us all up every morning. My, my final question, let's imagine that you're sitting right now in front of a teenager in Turkey, another teenager in the Middle East somewhere, like let's say Qatar or the UAE, and uh, someone that's in Africa or Asia. And they're all asking you, what should we do in the future? How can we ensure that this doesn't take our jobs? How can we ensure that we are relevant in the AI age? How can we be part of this future that you just laid out that's very op optimistic, that's extremely exciting? What would you recommend they do? Should they study something as a specific domain? Should they take a certain course? Should we just play with the technology? What advice do you have for them? The first thing I would say is you are unbelievably lucky. You are coming of age at probably the best time in human history. You understand this technology. Young people are always the early adopters of technology, almost always, but certainly in this case. And you will be able to use these tools to do things that the people in the generation before you couldn't even imagine. You will, you will have your entire career flooded with opportunity and the ability to do amazing new things. You'll be able to start companies that are phenomenally more impactful and successful than people the generation before you could. You will live in this incredibly expansionary, like, just flooded with time of like massive, massive opportunity. And you can kind of go do whatever you want. Uh, the, I think the rule, like the ground under us all is shifting, the rules are changing, but the amount of value that'll be created and the ability for an individual to create a vision and will, it's a great time. Thank you so much, Sam, for your time, for your insights. I would look forward to seeing you here in person in the coming cycles. Thank look you. Look forward to coming back soon. Thank, Thank you. you. So as we covered in yesterday's video, there are several big tech leaders, specifically AI leaders, that are taking global efforts to help AI take root in the various parts of the world. So for example, Sam Altman seeking trillions for AI chip fabrication from the UAE and others. So a lot of the things that we've talked about here, this is happening at the World Government Summit 2024. We have speakers like Sam Altman, Jensen Huang from NVIDIA. We have Jan LeCun of Meta slash Facebook. And the conference itself is taking place in Dubai. Jensen Huang is talking about how each nation, it's each sovereign nation should have their own sort of sovereign AI, their own AI that encompasses their data, their knowledge, their cultures, wisdom, etc. Now, as we covered in November, so the Biden administration has forced the Saudi Aramco venture capital firm to sell its shares in a Silicon Valley AI chip startup backed by OpenAI co-founder Sam Altman. So this was done by a review by the Committee on Foreign Investments in the United States. So this agency basically oversees deals that have national security implications. And right now, the U.S. is seeing these AI chips, these advanced chips, as a major national security implications. They're trying to have them manufactured more in the United States. TSMC, the big player out of Taiwan, has invested $40 billion into a new plant in Arizona. I think there's billions on the table for companies that are able to bring that manufacturing to the United States. So both OpenAI and Sam Altman and Jensen Huang of NVIDIA are trying to navigate these waters where they want to have cooperation with people in the Middle East, for example, that are trying to expand AI and invest in these technologies, while at the same time being careful not to run afoul of the US government and their security concerns. Stay tuned, there's more to come. My name is Wes Roth. Thank you for watching.